all the infections, all the poisonous plants that people were eating 30,000 years ago when they didn't know what was a healthy plant from a poisonous plant. The only reason we survived all these challenges to human existence was because there was always some people that could survive anything. There are people who are immune to AIDS. There are people with genetic variations in their genomes that make them immune to AIDS. And there were always people that were immune to the latest virus or the latest poison in the plants that everybody was eating. So some human beings have survived all these incredible historical challenges to human survival because of this incredible diversity. So in order to understand how the environment matters to an individual, we have to understand their genomes. We have to know what is in their DNA that makes them different. And that's the principle of how we can uncover uh, the mechanisms that will be individualized where the whole, you know, the holy grail now is this concept of personalized medicine based on individuals because we understand their unique features. Next slide. So let me talk a little bit about schizophrenia. And so there are three things we know about what puts somebody at increased risk of schizophrenia. The first thing we know is schizophrenia is like every common medical disorder. And by the way, I'm going to talk about schizophrenia, but this is true of autism, this is true of ADHD, this is true of bipolar disorder, this is true of most major psychiatric illnesses. There's no gene for mental illness. Genes do not know about a hallucination or a delusion or a panic attack. Genes know about how you build a brain. Genes know about how you make a cell work. So genes are about two things. They're about these fixed characteristics that we have all of our lives. How tall we are, what color our eyes are, what color our hair is. These are things, the fixed traits that are determined by genes heredity. The other thing genes do is genes are the blueprint that every cell in your body uses every second of its life to tell it how to live because genes, which is in this DNA, is the blueprint for building proteins. And the proteins are built by assembling strings of amino acids in a cell, and the, the recipe for doing that is in the DNA. So how a cell makes an enzyme, how a cell makes a protein that gives it a membrane that allows it to be a three-dimensional structure with integrity, how a cell moves, how a cell builds connections to other cells, which cells in the brain do. This is all determined by the construction of proteins that are based on your genetic code. So genes are about fixed traits you have all of your life that you inherit from your parents, but they're also about the biology of how a cell works. So we've known, if you could push the next slide. First thing we've known is that these ge these disorders are what's called polygenic. There are many, many genes across our genome. When I use the word genome, I mean all the genes in your DNA. So in a human being, there's about 20,000 genes that are dictated by the three billion letters of our DNA code. The DNA code has three billion letters in it, and that makes about 20,000 genes. That's a little bit misleading because those 20,000 genes can be assembled in various ways to produce several million proteins. Every cell has the capacity to make several million proteins out of those 20,000 cells. And that's how the cell manages to survive for 70, 80, 90, 100 years in some people. So we've known for a long time that there's no one gene that gives anybody a serious mental illness. There are combinations of many genes, just like there's no one gene that causes a heart attack, there's no one gene that causes the common form of diabetes, there's no one gene that causes asthma. These are caused by many different risk factors that combine to create a state of risk. That's the first thing we know. The second thing we know, next, push please, next slide. The second thing we know is that early life environment matters. When I say early life environment, I mean intrauterine life environment. And there's a number of pieces of evidence that have suggested that what happens during the period of time when brains are being built, which is in, during prenatal life, when brains are being built, is very important for the expression of mental illness, even during adulthood. So how do we know this? 
So in the world of schizophrenia, this is true of other conditions also, certainly true of autism, ADHD, dyslexia, Tourette syndrome, and to a lesser extent bipolar disorder. If a mother is pregnant during an influenza epidemic, or is pregnant during a time where there is a major famine, this has been studied around the world, there's about a two-fold likelihood that a ch offspring from that pregnancy will have one of these developmental behavior disorders. It increases the likelihood about twice what it would be otherwise. And there are many, many other conditions that affect the pregnancy. If you don't gain enough weight because of malnutrition, or you gain too much weight, it increases the probability. So many things that can affect what we call the intrauterine the environment that nurtures the development of a fetus can affect how a brain develops that ultimately puts somebody at risk to manifesting these conditions later in life. This is what we call the developmental trajectory. The developmental trajectory, if you want to think about how this works, I like to use this metaphor of bowling. When you go bowling, you want to roll this ball, and if you want to hit a strike, the goal is to make that ball go right over that first arrow that's just to the right of the midline on the bowling alley, about 10 feet from the starting place. If you get the ball to roll right over that arrow and has a little bit of a twist, it's gonna land in the strike zone. If the ball is one centimeter or a half inch off that arrow, by the time it gets to the pins, it's not a half inch off the pins, it's about three or four inches off the pins because it gets exaggerated as it moves down the alley. That's development. The, fir the, the, the destiny of that ball is determined based on its relationship to that arrow when it first hits that part of the alley. And as it moves down the alley, which is the period of development, it, this effect gets amplified. If it's three centimeters off the arrow, it's going to be way in the, five, five, in the seven pin. If it's 10 centimeters off the alley, it's going to be in the gutter. So this is a way of metaphorically thinking about how getting the trajectory right from the very beginning has long-term implications. We like to think that the, this is the genetics. The genetics is how much you are right on that arrow or not. What happens as the ball moves down the alley is that there is dust on that alley, which is environmental experience and the dust can deviate the trajectory further by pushing the ball further to the right, or it actually could push it further to the left and, and rescue some of the genetic predisposition. Where the ball goes relative to that arrow is the genetic predisposition. What happens to it as it moves down the alley is the environmental experience that follows that developmental, uh, early developmental phase. Part of the reason that we know that what happens in intrauterine life matters to your risk comes from studies of, of fraternal twins and studies of siblings from unrelated pregnancies. Identical twins share all of their genes. They are identical genetically. Fraternal twins are really just like siblings. They come from the same pregnancy, but they're completely separate genetically. And they're like any pair of siblings, they share 50% of their genes. Uh, siblings, all siblings are 50% identical, 50% different. Identical twins are 100% identical genetically, siblings are 50% genetically identical. But if you look at the probability <laughs> that if one member of the sibship has schizophrenia, what's the probability that the other has it? So if your siblings from unrelated pregnancies if one sibling has schizophrenia, there's about a one in 10 chance that the other sibling will have it. But if you're dizygotic twins, meaning you're the same genetically alike as siblings, but you share the same intrauterine environment, there's a twice greater probability than the average sibship that you would have schizophrenia. And this suggests that something about intrauterine life matters to risk for manifesting these conditions later in life, independent of genetical identity. Next slide. The last thing that we've known for a long time, which we have very little understanding of, is that all developmental behavior disorders, schizophrenia, autism,
ADHD, dyslexia, Tourette syndrome, all of these conditions are two to four times more likely in males than females. And there's been no understanding of this at all. So now I want to tell you some of the recent research data that suggests a way of maybe understanding these phenomena. Next slide. So this is the current state of the genetics of schizophrenia. And I don't expect you to process this, but this is just to make the point of where we are in finding genes. So the whole landscape has changed because of the DNA technology revolution in medicine. <laughs> we now can add, you know, we can now measure, we can count everybody's DNA code. We can measure it, we can determine it. It's relatively inexpensive. You know, it, uh, when I started this in the late 80s, early 90s, finding genes was like a needle in a haystack. I like to say today it's high school biology. In high school biology classes, people do gene discovery because it's become very, very relatively simple biological research to find genes and to be able to study DNA. So we've known in the upper left-hand corner, this is just to show you if you have one member of your family with schizophrenia, what is the probability that you in the same family will have schizophrenia. So if you're one of identical twins, it's 50-50. And depending on how much you are related to the person who has illness, your probability drops off pretty quickly. So if the general population is a 1% chance that anybody has schizophrenia, if you're a first cousin, you've got a 2% chance. There's a two-fold increase compared to the general population, but still very small. If you're a fraternal twin, it's 70%. If you're a child, it's 13%, et cetera. So this was the data that showed that these things ran in families. But now that we can measure genes directly by doing DNA analysis, there have been three different ways people have found genes for schizophrenia. The first is to actually read every single letter in the DNA alphabet in the parts of the genome that make proteins. And what's been found is about one out of every 200 people with the diagnosis of schizophrenia has what's called a mutation. They have a rare change in a DNA letter that affects the amino acids in a protein and affects the function of the protein. And about one out of every 200 people that we diagnose with schizophrenia, which is rare, an infrequent thing, has a mutation that likely is a major factor in the fact that they're ill. And it, because that mutation is making a particular protein not work right. There's another 2% of cases that have a larger um, change in the DNA code involving either the, get, the loss of segments of DNA, these are called copy number variations, or CNVs. About 2% of cases have one of these things, about one out of every 50 people have one of these. Um, these are, again, they don't necessarily account for schizophrenia in those individuals, but they're likely to be important risk factors. 97% of people that get the diagnosis of schizophrenia have none of those. They have combinations of the common variations in the human genetic code that all of us have some of. So all of us have some of the genes that have been linked to schizophrenia. People that have the diagnosis have a, light, a bigger burden of them, which is why they're at increased risk. Everybody has a few of these just like everybody has some gene for some medical illness that increases the chances of their medical illness. Everybody, we're, we're all at different risk states. Some people maybe have a risk state of 90%, some people have a risk state of 5%. We all have some risk state for these conditions. And th the way these are f discovered is by these studies which are called GWAS studies. And these are studies where you just basically assay every variation in the DNA code that, difference, that differs between people, that accounts for everybody being different, and looks at whether any of these are more likely to be found in people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. When you find that, you say this is a, a, a region of the human genome where a gene for schizophrenia is likely found. So that's the state of the art. Next slide. So we've learned a lot of lessons from these studies. These are the take home lessons. The first is there is no gene for psychiatric illness. Very important to realize this. Just like there's no gene for heart disease, there's no gene for stroke. 
There are genes that increase the risk of any of these common disorders. The genes do not, they're not genes for fate. They're genes for how much any individual is at risk. And obviously if you accumulate other risk factors, that risk accumulates. There is no royal road. There's no one way you get there. There are many different roads from a genetic point of view, many different ways you can inherit different combinations of different variations across these three mil billion letters that give you risk. Nobody is at risk because of one gene or another gene. You're at risk because of the whole complement of all the genes in your DNA code, which is referred to as the genome. The genome is all the genes that you have. Um, and the environment has to matter. We know this, but again, the environment is complicated. Everybody, when you think environment, you think, oh, did you have an argument with your father? Did you have a dif difficulty at school? What, did your girlfriend reject you? You know, there's, we, we all have I ideas what the environment is. But it's very important to remember that for a cell, which is what we are made of and what DNA is about, DNA is only about cells. The environment of a cell is the molecules that are floating around outside the cell that are talking to the cell. Cells only know about biochemistry and biology. They don't know about mothers or fathers or schoolmates or anything else. So in theory, whenever one has an experience that might be stressful or that might cause uh, someone to feel disappointed or angry or upset, there are molecular changes that are taking place that have impact on a cell and the DNA uh, is, is responding to this. So these are the lessons that we learned. How can we try to make some sense out of this from a more from the point of view of mechanisms. Next slide. Okay, so this is the schema for thinking about how genes translate into the mental conditions that, that are so disabling and that are the reason that organizations like NAMI exist. So genes, this is, the, this is sort of the, the landscape of how genes relate to behavior. Genes are about cells. Genes only know about the biology of cells. Genes only know about making proteins so a cell can do what a cell has to do. Genes don't know anything about cognition. They don't know anything about perception, thoughts, mood, etc. Cell, genes, cells handle molecular information. That's what cells do. The cells go work together to build organs. Genes don't even know about organs, they know about cells. But cells become tissues, they become organs early in development. So each of these levels of, of analysis involves an increasingly complicated kind of biology. Cells process molecular information, molecules. Tissues process more complicated information. So cells in the brain become systems of the brain that process environmental information. Brains process sensory information, they process emotional information, they process cognitive information. Genes know about cells which process molecular information. Cells form tissues like a brain which processes environmental information. And what we call behavior is presumably how these multiple levels of increasingly complicated biological function are observed by us in our complex social environments that we see that the, the outcome of all of this. So to understand how a gene through this big red arrow ultimately has anything to do with behavior, we have to understand how it affects these cells and how the effects it has on these cells affects the, the building of a brain uh, and the tissue and the circuits that these cells are important for. Ultimately, psychiatric illness is about how the brain processes information in the environment. That's how we recognize it. Let me give you a metaphor which I'm very fond of. Next slide. This is like thinking about how you go from the musical score that Beethoven wrote for Beethoven's Fifth Symphony to something that we hear as Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Because if you think about how this happens, you have all these little instruments, which are the cells. They each have this DNA code, which is the musical score, that they read. This musical score has absolutely no meaning whatsoever, except that the cells know what to do with it. 
which is the violins or the brass or the percussion or the strings. Because all this is, these are just contrasts on a strange thing. They're just nothing, except they have meaning to these instruments. And these instruments <coughs> read that and do something with it. And these instruments become part of systems in the orchestra. The strings, each violin has to be in tune with the other violins to be the strings. And they have to be the brass, and they have to be the percussion. And together, these sections, which are like the neural circuits of a brain, each processing different components of what this score, which is the DNA code, is telling these instruments to do, ultimately, if all of this is done the way it's intended, we recognize it as Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. But if the violins are out of tune, and they're not in phase with the other instruments in the string section, the string section is no longer in tune with the brass and the percussion and the woodwinds. And what comes out is not Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. So this is in many ways, I think, a useful metaphor for thinking about how starting with these genes, we end up with very disordered brain function, very disordered uh, uh, representation of what's meant to be a particular organized pattern of behavior here Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Next slide. So this is the challenge of our time. And I, I come representing this Lieber Institute for Brain Development, which I'll tell you about at the very end, where the challenge that we've um, been faced with is say, let's take this way of thinking about how genes affect the biology of cells and the development of brain systems that mediate complex environmental stimuli and use this information to somehow come up with treatments based on an understanding of mechanisms and not based on coincidence, accident, or, you know, or just pure happenstance. This is really the challenge of our time, I think, is to, is to use this new information that we've acquired about how, uh, what basic, basic biology of mental illness might be to come up with new strategies for improving the lives of affected individuals. Next slide. So let me just talk, I'm going to spend the next five minutes, I'm almost finished, talking about what we think the nature of this inborn genetic bias and starting that bowling ball down the alley, what it really means uh, in terms of how this affects early brain development. So we know, anybody that has children knows, that there are certain aspects of human temperament that are there from day one. There have been many studies of this. Jerome Kagan was a, was a very well-known uh, psychologist at Harvard University, he studied children the first two weeks of life and showed that many of the character, and I think you all know this as parents, many of the characteristics of your children in the first weeks of life, in terms of their sensitivity to environment, how they respond to discomfort, how they respond to being nurtured or supported or, or, you know, or coddled, how they respond to colic, many of these temperamental characteristics are there from very early in life and they remain relatively consistent features. Obviously they have different, it's not colic when you're 20, it's different features of environmental stress, but these features are born in very early in life, likely in the genetic um, uh, um, programs. And so we were very interested in the possibility, next slide, that, that what we, that, that there are early developmental components to mental illness. That they, way before anybody diagnoses these conditions, there might be aspects of how the bowling ball is offline from very early, but at a stage where you have no idea that by the time it gets to the pins, it's not going to be a strike. You wouldn't know that from where the bowling ball is at that time. Next slide. So we've done a number of studies, and I've been interested in this for over 30 years. And in fact, 31 years ago, this month, I published a paper in the American Journal of Psychiatry suggesting that if we wanted to understand schizophrenia, maybe we should stop focusing on the time that the diagnosis is made and start focusing on how brains get built and what sets them on this trajectory from very early in life. And maybe if we had a better understanding of this, we might have a better understanding of what these conditions are. And I also went so far at that time to suggest that these may not really be illnesses in the traditional medical sense of the word, 
but they're states of brain development that have a particular way of interacting with, inv with personal experience over the lifetime. They are this trajectory down the bowling alley rather than some illness in a typical medical sense where these cells are dying or they're sick or something else. So there have been many, many studies now, next slide, of a people with schizophrenia. These are mostly done in Europe where there are these big population-based public health registries where you can look at every person ever hospitalized in a country like Sweden or Denmark or England and you have all, the, all this early life history data on them. And many of these studies were done showing that people who, who are diagnosed with schizophrenia as adults have subtle variations in development from very early in life. So for example, it's been shown in Finland, Denmark, Sweden, and England, that as a population, the people who are diagnosed in their 20s with the diagnosis of schizophrenia sit up on average, not any individual, but the whole population. The average human being sits up at 26 weeks of age. That's the average. Some human beings sit up at 24 weeks, some sit up at 25 weeks, some sit up at 27, 28. But the average, right in the middle, 26 weeks. The average person who is diagnosed with schizophrenia in their 20s sits up at 28 weeks, two weeks later. About 23% of patients with schizophrenia as adults had enuresis as children. That's about two to three times the normal frequency of enuresis. Enuresis is bedwetting up to age 10, after age 5. It's not an uncommon thing, and because somebody has bedwetting when they're 10 years old, most of these people will not develop schizophrenia, and most people get grow out of it and are perfectly fine. But as a population, there's more of this associated with schizophrenia. First words are a little bit later in people as a population, not in every person, but the mean, the average, the tendency. All of these findings, which have been found in many, many studies, suggest that the trajectory for all these classic neurological milestones is slightly altered in very early in life in people who will later manifest schizophrenia. I want to emphasize that if your child sits up at 27, 28 weeks, that doesn't take the child to a pediatrician. There's nothing wrong with that. And it doesn't mean that this, the, most of those people will be perfectly normal. But as a population-based statistic, it suggests that, that, that there is a tendency in people who will later manifest schizophrenia that there was a slight deviation from this trajectory, presumably because there was a slight deviation in how the programs of building brains to ne negotiate these milestones was slightly altered. Next slide. So, next slide. So, we decided to ask a question about how brains are built by saying if we look at genes related to developmental behavior disorders, such as schizophrenia, autism, intellectual disability, which used to be called mental retardation, and some of these neurological disorders where children are very, very abnormal at birth, really very abnormal infants. If we look at the genes related to those conditions, and they have something to do with how a brain got started from early in life, we could reasonably imagine that the genes related to these conditions have to be active in the development of a fetal brain. They should be turned on during fetal life. And they should be more turned on during fetal life than in life after birth, because if they're about building the brain, since genes encode the proteins that build things, if they're about building a brain from the beginning, the genes that have been found for these things should be found in fetal brains that turned on. They're up. Genes are turned on meaning they're making all these proteins. We also looked at things like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, disease of late life. Those should not be turned on during the fetal time period. They should be turned on later in life. Next slide. So we did this. Uh, and this is done at the Lieber Institute for Brain Development, which is a, one of the resources I'll talk about in a few minutes, is we have made a major investment in acquiring human brain material. We have now over 2,400 human brains that are donated by the next of kin of people, most of whom come from medical examiner's office, unexplained deaths, and they're donated by the next of kin for medical research. 
And so we also have a large collection of brains of prenatal life, brains that of fetuses that for one reason or another did not survive. Next slide. So when we did this, this is a paper, it's not worth looking at it, it's just to show you how these things look in the literature. We looked at how these genes changed across human development from the second trimester of fetal life to age 90. And we looked in a, in a whole group of normal human brains to understand how genes got turned on and turned off at different stages of life. We did a whole bunch of analyses of this. And next slide. And this is what we found. We found that genes for schizophrenia were much more abundant during the fetal life period than they were postnatally. The genes that have been associated with schizophrenia, these are statistics, and just to make the point, it's not to get any of the details, the statistics were that if you had, that the genes even in the normal human brain that are related to risk for schizophrenia, they are much more abundantly turned on during the life of a fetus than they are during later life, suggesting that they have something to do with getting the brain going from the beginning. We also found that Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease were differentially expressed as genes across the lifespan, but in contrast to schizophrenia or autism or intellectual disability, which were genes turned on during fetal life, more so than after birth, the genes of, autism, of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease were turned on late in life compared to fetal life. So what, what this study showed was that the time of expression of turning on these genes related to these illnesses bore some relationship to what we think is going on in the brains of people that suffer from these illnesses. Next slide. The other thing we were very interested in is trying to understand the environment. So there's a way that geneticists study the environment because the environment affects how genes are turned on and off. So there's no bigger change in the environment in the life of a human being. Nothing comes close to it to be going from being a fetus to being alive postnatally. That is the biggest change in the environment that a human being experiences in his lifetime. Not a surprise. You would expect, you would expect that this is a major change for, for all systems are now exposed to stimuli that never existed before. Every cell in your body, whether it's a liver cell or a lung cell or a kidney cell or a brain cell, every cell has exactly the same DNA because it all starts from that fertilized egg. The fertilized egg has half its genes from the father, half its genes from the mother. That fertilized egg starts to divide and forms all the organs in the body. It has the same DNA, every cell, but a liver cell knows that it's not a lung cell. And uh, it knows it's not a kidney cell. And it knows it's not a brain cell. How does it know that? It knows that because of something called epigenetics, which is that there are proteins that coat DNA. And there are different chemical changes that are, happen to the DNA that allow certain genes to be silent and other genes to be active. When I say active, I mean they're making proteins, because that's what genes do. Because a liver cell has to make liver proteins. It can't make lung proteins. It can't make kidney proteins, because that's not what a liver cell's meant to do. So the way cells regulate what their identity is, is by this process called epigenetics. And epigenetics puts little chemicals, like these chemical groups, onto the DNA to change the landscape so that only the genes meant to be turned on by that cell are turned on and the genes meant to be silent stay silent. That's how you differentiate tissues. It's an epigenetic process because you have to deal with the fact that every cell is exactly the same DNA. So there has to be another mechanism that makes cells know what cell they're supposed to be. Now the environment affects this process called epigenetics. So if, you, if anything that I say tonight, which is a challenge, stays with you a week from now, how does it stay with you? How do you remember this stuff? What happens that makes you remember it? What happens is if you remember it for a long period of time, there has been a change in your DNA. Not the code, not the sequence of letters, but the chemical superstructure 
that changes what genes get turned on and what genes get turned off. That's how you make a new memory. You make a new memory because you make new connections between cells. That requires the building of proteins. That requires turning certain genes on. That's how you learn things. You can't learn anything unless you make new proteins. You can't make new proteins unless you change the availability of genes in your DNA to be turned on or turned off. That's epigenetic. So we can measure how the environment is changing what we call this epigenetic. It's called epigenetic because it's on the surface of the genes, not the code itself. It's not changing the code, it's changing how turned on or turned off different parts of the code are. Next slide. So we did this exact same thing. We looked in the brains of people with schizophrenia. First we looked at the brains of normal people across development from fetal life all the way to the age 90s. Perfectly normal people. Just try to understand what epigenetics looked like across human experience. And what we found was that there was a huge enrichment of changes related to going from being a fetus to being a newborn infant. And these changes were actually enriched for schizophrenia genes. That the schizophrenia genes that have been identified, the parts of the genome where they're found, are the same parts of the genome that show these big epigenetic changes uh, going from fetal to postnatal life. And in fact, the period of time around when we make this diagnosis, which is early adulthood from age 15 to 25, when 90% of people that we give the label schizophrenia to get this label, 90% of them are between age 15 and 25. This is a very stressful time of life. It's the first time you leave home for most human beings. It's hormonally very dynamic. The environmental experience is very stressful. It's the beginning of social relationships as an independent adult. We anticipate that there are many epigenetic things happening to your genome because of that time of life. You have to learn how to live independently. You have to learn how to manage all these hormonal things. You have to deal with all this environmental complexity, all the stresses, strains, temptations, all this stuff that happened in late adolescence. But those changes didn't bear any relationship to the genes for schizophrenia. Next slide. So the last thing we did was we said, okay, we have brains of several hundred people who died with schizophrenia during life. And we have brains of hundreds of normal people. Let's look at how their epigenetic landscapes are different. These are, these are many ways the tombstones in the genome of environmental experience. And we know that the environmental experience of somebody with schizophrenia is very different from the environmental experience of somebody who doesn't have schizophrenia. First of all, the patients take drugs, which obviously affect their brain and affect the epigenetic state of their genome. They have uh, medical problems. They have stresses, psychological stresses, that are unique and very serious, not experienced by the average individual. We would anticipate that there are many, many of these environmental influences that change these measures of, of what we call epigenetics. And we asked the question, if we looked at patients with schizophrenia whose brains we have, and we look at where the epigenetic changes are different, which are the telltale signs of how the environment affected them. What would we find those differences to reflect? Would they reflect what happened to them when they got ill clinically in their 20s? Or would they somehow reflect this time of life when the genes seem to set this ball off the, the normal trajectory? We asked that question. And this is what we found. Next slide we found that there was about 2,000 places across the genome where this epigenetic difference was found between patients and controls. 2,000 sites where the environment had left a mark on the genome saying that the environmental experience of individuals with this diagnosis differs in terms of how it affects their genome and how it affects genes being on and off from normals. But the amazing thing was even though these people die, most of our brains are people in their 40s. Many of these are suicides. Some of them are accidents. Even though these people have been ill for 20, 25 years, the differences between the patients and the controls 
reflected fetal life differences and not differences that occurred when the diagnosis was made. Even though we assume there have been very tumultuous things happening environmentally that influence the epigenetic marks that we see on the genome, they don't stay, they're not enduring, they don't last. We don't find evidence of them 20, 25 years later. In contrast, these things that happened in fetal life leave a mark that seems to be indelible, that lasts 40 years, that is still observable in the genomes taken from the brains of these individuals. Next slide. So these findings have suggested that risk factors for schizophrenia, these are the things that set that ball rolling slightly off that arrow. Both the genetic ones and the environmental factors that leave a mark in the adult brain are principally related to early brain development and not to the time, to tumultuous time of clinical diagnosis. So now the last question I want to address is what is happening during this early fetal period that might be creating this kind of, of uh, problem? Next slide. So we've been, we've been very interested in trying to look at how genomic risk and early fetal development combine to increase risk for schizophrenia. And the way we've looked at this is we've looked at genomes and we've looked at obstetrical histories because we know that complicated pregnancies, which can be preeclampsia, intrauterine growth restriction, very abnormal weight gain, either failure to gain weight or excessive weight gain, increases the probability that an offspring will have schizophrenia about twofold. So it goes from 1% to 2%. It's still the majority won't have it by any means, but it's a risk factor, increases risk. So we asked whether these things were combined. Next slide. And basically, we found they were strongly combined, they were strongly related to each other, and it led us to ask this question of whether or not, is it possible that these genes are interacting with obstetrical difficulties because they somehow influence the health of the placenta? Next slide. And so we were very curious as to what is going on in the placenta. So we've been studying how schizophrenia-related genes that have been identified from all these clinical studies influence the biology and health of the placenta. The placenta is deformed principally from the fetal genome. Very little of the placenta comes from the mother. 90% of the placenta comes from the fetal genome. So we studied the placenta coming from the fetal genome. This is not a mother thing. This is a fetal thing. And what we found was, next slide, that some of the schizophrenia genes sensitize the human placenta to environmental stress. Many stresses during pregnancy influence how inflamed the placenta gets. The placenta is an organ. It's very interesting because if you think about it, the placenta is the most neglected human organ. There is no organ taken out of a human body that is paid less attention to than the placenta. In fact, it's the only organ taken out of a human body that doesn't routinely go to the pathology lab to be looked at under the microscope. It's generally thrown in a silver bucket and thrown out, which is unbelievable when you think about it. I mean, obstetricians look at the placenta to make sure it has all the appropriate blood vessels, and then it's thrown out. There's been almost no research done on the human placenta, yet the human placenta is the critical organ for nurturing the fetus in development. And it is, it's a critical organ between, that provides an immunological barrier between the mother and all the maternal proteins and the fetal proteins. Don't forget, the fetal proteins come in part from the father's genome, which is completely alien to the mother's immune system. The mother's immune system has never seen any of these antigens from the father. But the fetus is making some of these, and the placenta is constantly having to deal with the potential immunological assault of maternal proteins on a fetus that has half of its genome not from the mother, and fetal proteins that the mother is experiencing as having half 
from a genome it's never seen. So the placenta is this critical barrier that defends both the mother against the fetus and the fetus against the mother while at the same time providing all the nurturance, nutrients, proteins, chemicals that the fetus needs to develop. So what we found is that um, a significant number of schizophrenia genes uh, influence the development of the fetus by affecting the biology of the human placenta. And these effects are much greater if the, pl if the placenta is from a male offspring than from a female offspring. Much, much greater. And we think that many of these uh, biases in male sex towards developmental behavior disorders has to do with the placenta of male offspring. And there are many, many studies in animals, by the way, that show exactly this. If you stress a pregnant rat or a mouse in a variety of ways, change the oxygen content, give it psychological stress, change the weight, change the proteins in the diet, the male offspring are much more affected than the female offspring. This is a, uh, we don't understand that very well, but the placenta of the male offsprings show much greater effects of all these uh, changes than do the placentas of female offspring. So this is a whole new insight into a piece of how early development, a mechanism by which early development influences the development of the fetus. These genes are not only about the developing fetal brain, some of these genes are indirectly about the fetal brain by directly affecting the health of the placenta. The reason we find this very exciting is that in many ways the holy grail in all of medicine is prevention. Prevention is the holy grail. It may be much easier to prevent something than to correct it once it happens. And this is a potential insight into a strategy that might make placentas healthier and ultimately reduce the probability that this bowling ball has a disadvantage from very early in life. If you think about what we do to improve placental health, we give multivitamins and folic acid. That's the extent to which we treat placentas. There has to be much more that could be done to make placentas healthier. Next slide. So this work is being done at the Lieber Institute for Brain Development. So the Lieber Institute for Brain Development was founded by two families who were extremely active in the early days of NAMI, the Lieber family of New York and the Maltz family of Cleveland, Ohio. They were the principals behind the NARSAD uh, development program, which was the National Association for Research in Schizophrenia and Affective Disorders. The Lieber and Maltz families are the principal philanthropists in mental illness research for the last 30 years, probably. And together, the, the um, NARSAT has given out over $350 million over the last 30 years in small grants for mental illness research. I like to say they're the American Cancer Society of research in mental illness. And the Lieber and Maltz families had a vision now over 10 years ago to create a new institution that would be focused on using this information about genetics, the environment, and early brain development to find new ways to improve the lives. And that's what this institute's devoted to. We have over 100 multidisciplinary experts. We're in this building, we're at the whole third floor of that building on the Johns Hopkins Medical Campus. This was an institution devoted to bringing together scientists from diverse backgrounds, computational scientists, geneticists, neurologists, psychiatrists, neuropathologists, have them work in a common space with a common mission, with a commitment beyond just their personal career goals to try to address this basic problem. Next slide. Uh, and these are the two families that found, found, found this very regrettably. Connie was lost to us two years ago, uh, but the dream that she had was to find out what causes these disorders. We, had, we felt it had to be a concerted effort to study the brain and how it develops, and this is what this institution is all about. And I mention this only because if any of you are in the mid-Atlantic states and you have some free time, we would love to have you visit the Lieber Institute for Brain Development. We'll show you a lot of what's happening there. Uh, we, are, uh, we have very uh, um, devoted to using this research data to, I always like to say, you know, we're focused on deliverables. And the definition of a deliverable is a result that benefits somebody other than the scientists that discovered it. So this is very much the goal of this institute. Because we were very fortunate to have very, very significant
um, uh, resources devoted to this from these two families. The Lieber Institute has a little bit of the luxury, which is increasingly difficult in the traditional academic world today, to have scientists not be worried day in and day out about their funding because this is unfortunately today a very difficult environment for scientists. Somebody like Dr. Nemiroff has managed to support large number of very gifted scientists for a long time by finding ways to put support together. It's very difficult. Um, so we think this is a, an opportunity to maybe have some capacity to not be preoccupied with that. I think that's it. Next slide. Yeah, these are the conclusions. So complex behaviors are the result of multiple factors that interact biologically. Genes are the first objective clues to the causative mechanism of psychiatric disorders. Genetic risk for schizophrenia, genetic risk. Again, when I talk about risk, I mean puts you on a precipice. It doesn't mean you've fallen off the edge. It just means you're a little closer to that precipice. Involves principally genes showing transcriptional and epigenetic changes, epigenetic being changes related to environmental experience, related to early fetal life, and not for changes around the time that we make this diagnosis, which is very curious. The most significant genetic variants detected by current studies contribute to risk of schizophrenia, at least partly, by converging on a developmental trajectory that's sensitive to intrauterine and perinatal adversity and linked with abnormal placental function. I haven't gone into all the details of this, but we've shown that these genes are related to how n abnormal a placenta is. Gene environment interactions influencing placental biology may account for the higher incidence of schizophrenia in males compared with females. And the last slide, if you just push it one more time. Preserving prenatal health, whatever that means, because we don't really know how to do this better than multivitamins and folic acid. But now that there's a new frontier, we think in research about brain development related to placental health, there might be some new insights how to do this, may resent a primary form of prevention of schizophrenia, especially in males who are at high genetic risk. So that's what, I, what the state of the art is in terms of work we've done at the Lieber Institute for Brain Development. I'm very interested in your questions, comments, thoughts, reactions. And Let's I, do it. Thank you very much. And I'm going to tell you that um, these microphones work. If you press the bottom, you'll be able to ask a question. <laughs> so, Vanessa, you can yeah, press the button and turn green. Hi, Dr. Weinberger. I want to Hi. thank you um, on behalf of the Board of NAMI Miami for this fascinating talk on uh, such a timely subject. Um, I recently came across some research regarding a connection between vitamin D deficiency and autism spectrum disorders. I was wondering if you could speak on that, if you found any um, either common research that you've come across with regards to any um, link between that and So. That's a very good question about the relationship of autism spectrum disorder and schizophrenia. So from the genetic point of view, there's a lot of overlap. I mean, we, you know, there, there are certainly in the early life histories of people who may have diagnosed schizophrenia, many people have autistic spectrum-like features earlier in life. Many individuals, there'd be social difficulties, somewhat isolative, but there's clearly a, a distinction clinically. The age of onset's different. The degree of psychosis tends to be much greater in schizophrenia than in autism spectrum disorder. Um, but many of the genes are quite similar, actually. And we think these developmental effects are probably very similar. In some ways, we think, you know, what's, what's very complicated is to understand how risk translates into these different syndromes. So we think that part of what happens in autism is that the developmental burden, the noise in development is greater and it's harder to compensate for it earlier in life. Whereas the noise in schizophrenia in the developmental programs that ultimately will manifest as these disorders have less of an impact in early childhood and that they are 
less obvious, but there's, there's a considerable overlap biologically. Can you put the microphone on? Is it on? Green. Here you go. Have you come across any research that links a deficiency in vitamin D during early pregnancy with schizophrenia? Has that come across the research that might link it to So I don't know of any um, good research on that. But clearly, you know, there have been a lot of um, anecdotal stories about various vitamin deficiency syndromes and they're being linked to increased behavior disorders. I just think, you know, I think the jury's out on that. The microphone's not working. Yours. Oh, okay. Oh, I see that, yeah. Bottom. I got it, it's working now. What are the principal organs of the brain that are affected uh, or, or that affect schizophrenia? And what is the most popular um, treatment that you can? Okay, so a good, very good question. What are the principal organs? When we talk about that, we talk about circuits. That's the way people talk about it with the Not brain. So much, you got organs and um, parts of the brain. Yeah, parts of the brain. Correct. So we, the word that neuroscientists use, circuits. Mm -hmm. So you know, again, every cell has the genetic risk. So the re real issue is there are probably many parts of the brain affected, but there are some that mediate the features, the behavioral features that allow us to recognize that this illness is, is affecting somebody's be be ability to function. So there's been a lot of focus on the frontal lobes because the frontal lobes have to do with judgment, planning, following through on action, being able to understand that what you see is not necessarily what you get um, because part of being able to negotiate as a human being a complex environment is you have to not be taken in by every stimulus that occurs to you. And part of the problem many patients with schizophrenia have is they will be distracted by stimuli that are not critical to what they're trying to accomplish at any given moment. And they have difficulty weeding out the critical stimuli from the less relevant stimuli. We think that has a lot to do with frontal lobe function, the ability to be able to pick out target information from noise in the environment. Because if you can't do that, you can't really follow through on a on an organized plan of action. So, and, and many of the memory problems we think of frontal lobe problems. There's also other areas related to emotional function like the hippocampal formation. Mm -hmm. So these, the, you know, again, the areas that have received the most attention in research mm -hmm. have been the so-called hippocampus, mm -hmm. which is about storing memories, forming memories, but it's also about attributing meaning to environmental stimuli, and the frontal lobe, which is about using information to guide behavior in a environmentally appropriate way. And so we think those are the two regions of the brain that at least by virtue of not working as well as they might, they translate into some of the behavioral features that are most disabling. Neural, neural, chemi neural uh, chemicals, what in, in a schizophrenic person, is there, is there a, a neurochemical that's more so we don't. Or less. So that's a good. I mean, so there have been many theories over the years. So you know, the most popular theory, the most popular theory of schizophrenia for a long time had to do with this chemical called dopamine, mm. and this was based on the idea that every antipsychotic drug that we use affects this chemical called dopamine, mm. uh, and it's probably true that dopamine contributes. I always like to think that dopamine is like the volume control on the radio. It doesn't set the channel but it sets the amount of noise coming out of that channel. So it may be that you know, the channel is slightly off, there's too much static in the tuning, which I think has a lot to do with how these circuits work in schizophrenia. They're not tuned as well as they could be. And the dopamine is this volume control, so there's too much noise coming from that poorly tuned channel. And when we give antipsychotic drugs, it's pretty turning down this volume. Um, you know, there's an old joke, if I can tell this. Not, it's a little bit not politically correct, but it's not too bad. 
<laughs> when chlorpromazine was first discovered, the first antipsychotic drug, chlorpromazine, th thorazine, was the first antipsychotic drug. When it was first discovered, the um, neurosurgeon who discovered it said to his friend, the psychiatrist, you know, I had this patient that we just did surgery on. We gave him chlorpromazine. And before we gave him the drug, he was screaming at me, Doc, I'm going to kill you, you son of a bitch. I'm going to kill you. After we gave him the chlorpromazine, he was sitting quietly in the corner with his legs crossed, saying, I'm going to kill you, you son of a bitch. I'm going to kill you, you son of a bitch. <laughs> so that may say something about how it works. Yeah. What was that last comment? Make that last comment again. I understood you to say that there's no relationship other than genetics uh, to uh, the development of schizophrenia, so that maybe uh, an early childhood adversity, uh, child abuse, would not be related to schizophrenia. Is that true? Okay. So the question of early child abuse. Now, there's no question that early child abuse, whether it be neglect or actual physical abuse is a huge environmental insult with long-standing implications. Dr. Nemiroff has done some of the seminal work on this showing that early child abuse is a major risk factor for depression later in life, for PTSD later in life, for a variety of anxiety stress syndromes. These, this is very, it's also, by the way, I'm sure Charlie would agree with this, it's not just early child abuse as a risk factor for psychiatric disorders. It's a risk factor for many classic medical disorders, including diabetes, heart disease, pulmonary disease, and whether it, ch it creates a chronic stress state with chronic inflammatory activation that has lifelong adverse effects on organ development. The irony of it is, the evidence that early, and Charles, you may have a comment on this, that early child abuse is a risk factor for schizophrenia is less clear than it is for most other psychiatric illnesses. And probably bipolar disorder, it's less clear. For depression, anxiety disorder, syndromes, it's very clear. PTSD, very clear. So, you know, uh, I think we're dealing with different kinds of problems, but the evidence that, ch that child abuse is a risk factor for schizophrenia is, is not nearly as strong as it is for other psychiatric disorders, if it, if it exists at all, frankly. So, you know, I, again, human beings come in all varieties. So if somebody is genetically endowed from their parents to have an IQ of 140, that's their genetic endowment. And they have, you know, IQ is both genetic and environmental. Because if you're brought up in an environment where you have no stimulation or you're abused, your innate genetic predisposition for intellectual development will be adversely affected. But if you have the opportunity and you have the genetics to have an IQ of 140 and you are somebody prone to have schizophrenia, your IQ will be 130. It won't be 140. And that's been shown in many family studies that in general, the person, now obviously there's exceptions to everything, but at the individual level there are exceptions, but at the population level, on average, people who are in a family who develop schizophrenia have about 10 IQ points lower than their siblings have or than their parents had. So, the, you know, in general, schizophrenia is not associated with an, in, with an enhanced IQ. It may not be totally true for bipolar disorder, where there's some evidence suggesting that, that the bipolar disorder genetics may actually bias towards slightly higher um, IQ, maybe. It's controversial. But schizophrenia is definitely not. Now, just to remind you, 
these diagnoses are not perfect. And so depending on where you are and where you're treated, people have you know, some variation across the United States and across the world in who they call schizo with schizophrenia, who they say has bipolar disorder, who they say has obsessive compulsive disorder. I mean, there's some imprecision in, in how f you know, clinicians apply these labels because they're, they're based on appearance, behavior, and there's some subjectivity to this. So you can't take it too literally. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. On one of your slides, thank you, by the way, I've learned so much, but on one of your slides, there was a, um, uh, some adolescence, it was the impact, I think, uh, fetal yeah. adolescence and it said cannabis. What was that association ah, that you were trying to discuss? Very good. Yeah, so there have been a lot of studies, mostly coming from Europe, <laughs> arguing that excessive marijuana smoking in early adolescence increases the probability that somebody will manifest schizophrenia later in the life. Again, these are all, you have to remember, these are all probabilities. It doesn't mean, most people that smoke marijuana do not develop schizophrenia, obviously, because almost everybody's smoking marijuana now. So most people <laughs> don't develop schizophrenia. But there's some data suggesting, the reason it's controversial, it is controversial, it's not controversial Early marijuana use, early meetings aged 12 to 15, is associated with increased probability of schizophrenia. The controversy is, is it a cause or is it an effect? In other words, is the, are the people smoking marijuana at 15 already experiencing symptoms? They're anxious, they're uncomfortable, and the marijuana smoking is a way of relieving anxiety. So that's why it's controversial whether it's a cause or it's effect. But the association, which does not imply cause or effect, the association is probably real. By the way, now that we have the whole West Coast now, the entire West Coast, Washington, Oregon, California, recreational marijuana use is legal. So we're going to have much more data about this. Um, there's no question that smoking marijuana causes car accidents, by the way. This has been a huge finding now. Fatal car accidents in Colorado. So I mean like 40% of them have been smoking marijuana. So, you know, it doesn't protect you from having a car accident. Yeah. <laughs> you, you mentioned the, the, the overactive brain that reacts to all the stimuli. Um, what can you do if you see if you see or know somebody like that? What's the best treatment, or what are the various options for for helping that person? So, I mean, you know, I, there's no substitute for having a person treated professionally by a competent um, psychiatric care program. There's just no no compromise. There's nothing superior to that. Uh, and the best treatment is certainly medical treatment combined with family and environmental structured treatment. I, you know, I, I used to get into these arguments about the role of talking treatment in schizophrenia. And it's ridiculous to think there's no role for it because if you treat people with epilepsy, you have to talk to them about taking their medicines. When you treat people with diabetes, if you don't have a good relationship with your doctor who helps you understand what you have to do to control your diabetes, your diabetes are gonna be out of control. There's nothing that makes having mental illness any different. You have to have a relationship, an alliance with a caregiver who you trust is competent is caring, is experienced, who can help you as a patient understand how to live the best life you can live with the realities of having this particular illness. The problem with mental illnesses, in contrast to diabetes or heart disease or high blood pressure, which is why it's so difficult, is the parts of the brain that are affected are the very parts of the brain that make it hard to have an alliance with, these, with somebody with this illness. That's why it's so challenging. Because when you have diabetes or high blood pressure, you know, you can sit down with somebody, look, this is a danger, you've got a problem here. You, if this, you don't take your insulin, or you don't take your medicine, you don't, you're gonna have very serious side effects. And because your brain is not working against that alliance, 
you can follow through on that if you're motivated and reasonable and take serious attention. The problem with many bipolar disorder in particular, because people miss being manic and they stop taking their meds because they miss the experience of being manic and high and feeling like they could conquer the world. And patients with schizophrenia don't trust their caregivers. They're, they have misunderstanding of the information they're getting. And it's very hard for them to have an alliance with somebody they don't trust, they feel is part of a conspiracy. They don't believe the medicines are good for them. They think they're damaging their brain. So this is the real challenge, and it takes, takes patience, it takes persistence, it takes a good program that recognizes these complications and difficulties and doesn't throw out in the towel prematurely. It's a struggle, and it's, a, it's you know, I mean, these illnesses are lifelong challenges. But the reality is people can do well, you know, Yeah. Is it possible that uh, the use of uh, it's, it's green? Uh, uh, is it possible that the use of the like, hormones of the bear to help the egg attach to the uh, uterus could have caused the problem? I don't know. So again, I, I think the question's a very important one because. You know, obviously, there has to be much more work done to understand how many things that happen during a pregnancy affect the health and biology of the placenta. Which is just so little known about this um, that it's that it's obvious. Now, th th there's a there's a change happening actually. The National Institutes of Child Health and Development, which is this big institute, NIH, has a big placenta initiative now. It's like people have woken up to this idea that this has been completely overlooked and ignored for a very long time, that you could, make, you know, placenta is a, is a biological tissue. It's a very complicated biological tissue. There are many proteins and chemicals made by the placenta that are critical, whoops, is this thing, yeah, that are critical for fetal development. And so we've done very little to try to improve how that, how that operates, just very, very little, nothing. And as I say, it's multivitamins and folic acid, which is silly. I think this is a whole new area of research that has to be explored. You know, there's a lot of sensitivity to giving pregnant people any chemicals. You know, so there has to be a new science developed that does not penetrate the placenta, that does not get to the fetus, but that somehow works at the level of placenta directly. And again, I think, I think my guess is over the next five to ten years we'll be seeing a lot more work exploring this question.